Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Chaucer's Books Virtual Author Discussion with Dr. Anna Machen, the author of Why We Love, The New Science Behind Our Closest Relationships, a Pegasus Books presentation. To pur purchase Why We Love, browse other books, or check out our upcoming events, please go to our website at chaucersbooks.com. Speak at events on Tuesday at 7 p.m. Pacific, we'll host local author Olivia Seltzer, who will discuss her nonfiction title, Cram This Book, with Aurora Lydia Dominguez. While our guests and I are the only ones seen and heard on this webinar, please feel free to utilize the chat, uh, the Q&A function located at the bottom of your screen. Tonight's event is being simulcasted and recorded for our YouTube channel and will be available upon program's completion. And if you are watching from YouTube, as many of you are, please post your questions in the chat. So we hope to get to those as well. So let's begin. With Valentine's Day around the corner, one can say that oxytocin and dopamine are in the air. And to talk about that, let's welcome our speaker from Oxford, England, Aunt Dr. Anna Machen, who has prepared a special presentation. Dr. Machen is an evolutionary anthropologist. She is a world renowned for her multidisciplinary approach to the science and anthropology of close human relationships, which she commenced over a decade ago alongside Professor Robin Dunbar at the University of Oxford. A passionate advocate of science communication, she has written for The Guardian, The Observer, and The New York Times, while regularly working in other media outlets, including the BBC. She is the author of a book on fatherhood, The Life of Dad, The Making of a Modern Father. And this is her second book, Why We Love, The New Science Behind Our Close Relationships. Please welcome Dr. Anna Meiji. Hi, Anna. Hi. Before we begin our presentation, I have to say that this is a wonderful blend of scientific research and interesting stories and accounts. And what, what struck me the most is a lot of things, a lot of old adages that we say, like love is blind, opposites attract, absence makes the heart grow fonder, are science-based. And I found mm -hmm. that very interesting that you covered this and many other things. The wonderful book, and I was wondering how long it took and how did you manage to put it all together? Wow, I think in terms of writing it, it probably took about a year. I was in one sense really lucky. That I wrote it during the first year of COVID. So I'm sure mm -hmm. if COVID hadn't happened, it made, would have been a much bigger rush. But actually the highlight of that, that year, which we all found so hard, was talking to so many people around the world on Zoom about their mm -hmm. love. It was the highlight of my day. So it took about a year. But it's been in fruition for 20 years. Um, I did my PhD in 2000, 200, yeah, 2003, and I was doing the evolution of social and sexual behavior then. And then when I moved to Oxford in 2008, I carried on, but I got to do it uh, on alive people, which is always much better, um, mm -hmm. and I've been doing it ever since, really. So it's, it's a really long gestation period. And I suppose I decided to write the book because I kind of realized that there's, there's a, you know, a few books out there. Mm -hmm. about love about the science of love but I think they were all kind of looking at one angle of it and actually when you delve mm -hmm. into human love it's so complicated and I think we only do it true justice if we look at all those angles and we bring them together so that the reader gets a full picture of what human love really is and I hope can relate to it the whole point of the book is I want people to read it and go oh right aha got it that's me or I understand why I do that now or you know oh wow somebody who loves dogs as much as me or whatever it might be and realize mm -hmm. the full spectrum of human love they have in their lives and, and we are really lucky as a species to get to get to do that interesting and I have to add that evolutionary anthropologists I think that's one of the coolest jobs in the world <laughs> that you have so <laughs> Um, was it difficult to translate it? I mean, you're from the academic background. Oxford, I heard, is a pretty good school. It's and right. yeah. <laughs> and um, but to translate it for human consumption, because somebody who's non scientific like myself was able to ingest it pretty easily. Mm. And if you can talk about the process of making it palatable for non academics. Do you know what's really helped me do that is I've spent 
probably the last four years, spending a lot of time doing a lot of talks about love to the general public. And it's actually their questions at the end of those talks in a way that have shown me what people want to know, what wow. interests them, what maybe I haven't explained as well as I could do. And actually it was that kind of school, that teaching me that this is how I need to convey this to people so, that, so it relates to their own lives. That was really, really helpful. I will also say I have an incredibly good agent who the very first time when I wrote my, my first book, um, she managed to beat the very boring academic writing out of me. I must admit the first draft I gave her of my first book seriously you could use it for insomnia it's just so boring. Uh, but she was amazing and she's 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 based in oxford and she's very good at taking us sort of fusty old academics and basically polishing us up so that we can speak to to the general public rather than just talking in jargon so she's really good well kudos to your agent for, yeah, absolutely. for uh, breaking you in for that one so we can have this one so <laughs> i'm going to go off camera and uh you have like a 30 30 plus minute presentation i'm just going to yep let you go for it. So. Okay, brilliant. Thank you so much. Okay, so hello, everybody. And, and thank you so much for joining me today. I'm very jealous. You're all in sunny Santa Barbara, and I'm in very windy, very cold, very dark Oxford. But um, I'm going to read you a little bit of, of the book first. And in fact, it's the prologue, which will kind of explain to you, I suppose, why I decided to write down this story, and a little bit about what the book contains, the questions it asks, and the sort of the, the evidence it covers. So it's fair to say that this is not the first book written about love. Indeed, the shelves of bookshops and libraries are crammed with authors proffering their views on love from many different perspectives, psychological, philosophical, scientific, cultural. During my years of studying love, I have read many of these books and they have provided helpful insights and set me down new routes of research. But what many of them have tried to do is provide the answer to the question, what is love? Love is regularly reduced to a set of chemicals in the brain or an entirely cultural construct or the route to great art and creativity. And this is unsurprising. We are a knowledge hungry species who dislikes uncertainty. We are never happier than when we have a clear understanding of where we are going. But the thing about love is this. It's complicated. As an anthropologist, my job is to observe my fellow humans and then explain as fully as I'm able the cause of the behavior or anatomical quirk I see in front of me. And this means I'm a little bit like a magpie, borrowing ideas and techniques from other human focused disciplines to make sure I have sought out all the evidence that enables me to present an answer at all levels of explanation. The goal is 360 degree understanding. The result of this is that straightforward answers are often elusive, and the study of love is no different. All the disciplines of academia seem to have their own answer to the conundrum of love. But in contrast to other areas of study where all these explanations can be a bit of a headache, when it comes to love, my reaction is one of awe. I am in awe of the sheer immensity of love, in awe of the way it infiltrates every part of our life and every fiber of our being. In awe of how it sits at the very centre of our existence, such as its power to shape our health, happiness and life course. In awe of how we get to experience love in so many ways and with so many people, animals and beings. I think we are incredibly lucky. So this book intends not to give you a single answer to the question, what is love? Instead of delivering a nice, neat explanation by reducing the cause to a single factor, it intends to do the exact opposite. This book gives you the expansionist answer. I want to present you with 10 responses which separately give a strong and robustly evidenced answer to the questions which permeate our discussions about love. My aim is that by bringing these diverse answers together and making it clear that no single one is the complete answer, I might just give you an inkling of the immensity and the true awesomeness of human love. All forms of love will be considered romantic, platonic, spiritual, futuristic and parasocial, and all the scientific and social scientific explanations interrogated. This does mean that at the end there will be no formula for love, no neat explanation that will guide your life and keep you on track and to timetable. But what I hope there will be is a reborn acknowledgement of the immensity of love and a reconsideration of the many places where love exists in your life. Because I think we might have started taking love for granted, reducing it to a chore that we can efficiently tick off our list with the use of social media. And in the West, our privileging of a romantic love above all else has meant that maybe we have forgotten the other forms of love that we have in our lives. Those with family, friends, pets, gods, which we ought to go to making us who we are, because that is the part of the joy of being human, 
And like many of our fellow animals, we get to experience love in so many ways. I will use evidence from across the disciplines to build my arguments. So the hard sciences of genetics, pharmacology and neuroscience will make regular appearances. We will also encounter psychology, philosophy, social anthropology and theology, because the explanation for any human behavior or experience is inevitably multi-layered. So, yes, this is a science book. But more than that, it is a book about a key aspect of the human condition. As a result, I hope there is something for everyone. And there is no need to be a scientist or an anthropologist to follow my arguments because we are all experts in love. To reinforce this, as well as giving you easy to follow summaries of what we academics know, you will also hear the voices of real people recounting their experiences of love and relationships with everyone from their child to their best friend, their dog to their god, and even their favourite band. I hope you can add yours to them. This book is about the why, how, what and who of love. It'll explain why love evolved in the first place and how all of our bodily mechanisms, behavioural, psychological, physiological, neural, are attuned to make sure we grab it and keep it. It'll unpack what causes love to be such a profoundly individual experience and explore the mechanisms, both biological and cultural, that make how I love and how you love different. It'll explain how love is both intensely private, but also made public by the rules our society imposes about how and who we love. It'll explore the loves we underestimate and ask you to reconsider love not as an emotion, but as a need as fundamental to us as the food we eat and the air we breathe. And it will touch on the less considered aspects of love, its darker sides, and where our quest for love might take us in the future. It is my fervent hope this book will act to both reassure and challenge you. As humans, the outlets for our love are so many that I truly believe that we can all find love in our lives, but we be it with a lover, friend, dog or God. But the question remains, are we able to sit comfortably with a phenomenon that could both heal and harm and which ultimately is guaranteed to be unpredictable? I am writing this prologue during the second COVID-19 wave in the UK. COVID has been devastating to us all on so many fronts. But I think one good thing that might have come out of it is a renewed understanding through experience of what is most important in our lives, to our health, our happiness and our life satisfaction. And it is who we love. Because COVID has taken away our opportunity to be with each other and has brought to the forefront our immense visceral need for each other, whether it be the hug of our friends or parents or the key workers who have made sure we still receive the essential elements of life, food, water, care. People who have perhaps sacrificed their contact with their loved ones, as many in our health services have, to ensure they are present to look after the loved ones of others. Human cooperation, human love is awe-inspiring. I believe it defines our humanity. And COVID has shown us that when everything else is stripped away, it is all we have and ultimately all we need. But first, to start at the beginning, love as survival. So what I'm going to do now is take you through a bit of a whiz of the why, how, who and what of love. Now, it's going to touch on some of the themes of the book. Not all of them, I'm afraid. We don't have time for that tonight. But I just want to give you an idea of, of the mixture that's within the book, both of sort of the biological explanations, the psychological, the neural and also the sociological explanations of what love is. But we're going to start at the very beginning with why we love. So I'm now just going to try and share my screen, which I hope is going to work. Hold on one second, please. Do you, oh, I think you've disabled my screen sharing. Okay, so well, let's <laughs> make you a co-host. Sorry about that. That's okay. Right, let me let me have another go. Here we go. Is that going to work? Okay, yes. that's looking good. Okay, so we're going to start off with the fundamental question, the title of the book, Why We Love. At the most basic level, the reason why we love is because it helps us to survive. It is, as with all human adaptations, related to our survival and the survival of our genes. You see, humans are arguably the most cooperative species in the world. We have to cooperate in lots of different ways with a vast range of different people and across extended periods of time. And this is quite a tricky thing to do. Ideally, most of us would actually prefer to be solitary. But because we have two anatomical quirks, it has meant that we rely on each other for so many different things. And those two anatomical quirks are our enormous brains and our narrowed pelvises because we are bipedal. And this means that we've had to rely upon each other to carry out three very key life survival things. The first of those is we need to rely on each other to subsist. If you think of the environment in which we evolved, we would rely on each other to have knowledge about water sources, to learn how to nap a flint or to group together to hunt an animal so that we could eat. 
But even today, when I know probably in America justice here, you can pretty much get everything you want from your sofa without actually talking to anybody in person. If you think of the number of people who are involved, for example, in picking, packing, growing, all those orders that come to your door, then we are still relying upon each other simply to subsist, albeit at a distance. The second thing we have to rely upon each other is to learn. We love innovating humans. We are constantly coming up with new things, new learning, new knowledge, new technology. But the problem with all this is there's absolutely no way you or I could learn everything we need to learn to exist on a trial and error basis on our own. So we have to rely upon each other to learn everything we need to know. And if I were to tell you we are the only species on the planet that actually actively teaches each other, you might realize how complex a behavior this learning is. And finally, we have to cooperate to raise our children. As anyone who's ever cared for a newborn baby or even a toddler knows, to be honest, they're pretty useless and incredibly good at getting themselves into trouble. And the reason for this is human babies are born much earlier than they should be. And that is simply so that their head can fit through the pelvis and protect the life of both mum and baby. So we are born very early. But this means, particularly in those first two years after we are born, we have to go through a period of accelerated brain growth. Our brains are not fully developed. And if you think of the number of people who input into a child's life, help the mother and the father to raise that child, it might be extended family, it might be friends, certainly a lot of professionals are involved, then it takes a team of people to raise a child. We have to cooperate with each, each other to do that. So that's all great. We really need each other. But the problem is, with this is this. Cooperation is incredibly stressful. Because for a start, people lie and they cheat and they steal. And you have to be incredibly good at spotting the people who are in your group who are going to sap your strength and be critical to your survival so that you don't waste your time investing in relationships with them. And one of the things we've had to spend a lot of energy evolving is a massive architecture in our brain, which enables us to spot these people so that we can give them a wide berth. Secondly, we exist in a hierarchy like a lot of primates. So there are some people at the top, some people at the bottom and some people in the middle. And we all have to spend a lot of time monitoring everybody in the hierarchy so we know exactly what they're doing. Are they building alliances with other people? Are they trying to steal my place just to make sure that we maintain or hopefully raise our position in that hierarchy? So a lot of our energy and a lot of our effort is spent doing that rather than, for example, having a good snooze or finding some food to eat. So we have to commit a lot of time to this social cooperation. Thirdly, it's going to do it for me. There we go. Uh, we have to compete for those resources. If we were on our own, there would be no competition, but we have to compete with each other for those resources. And secondly, we have to coordinate our time with the other people with which we live. And it might be that sometimes we have to do things for the good of the group, which actually are costly to us and which ideally we would not use. So being sociable, being cooperative can actually levy a cost upon you. And finally, potentially the hardest cooperation of all is we have to cooperate between the sexes. Now, in the environment in which we evolved, this cooperation was difficult because we were trading unlike currencies. Same sex cooperation always evolves before cross sex cooperation. And it's simply because when you cooperate within your sex, you are generally trading the same currency. It's important when you cooperate with somebody that you keep a tally of how much time you've helped them and how many times they've helped you. It's important that that tally is reasonably even so you make sure you're not being taken advantage of. And that's easiest when you trade the same currency. So, for example, before fathers evolved, it, women helped each other with their childcare and they traded childcare for childcare. So it was quite easy to tell whether we were keeping that tally of reciprocity pretty equal. In the same way, males would build alliances with each other. So how often had Bob helped you in a fight to get a female and how often had you helped him? Again, it's the equal currency. But once you start having males and females cooperating and they cooperated in the first instance at together to raise their joint children, then you have a different currency because initially women wanted the males to help with their child club, but men stuck around with those women because they wanted to be the next one to have sex with her and hopefully be the father of her next child. So they were trading unequal currencies. And therefore, again, we've had to build a massive cognitive architecture to enable us to calculate these different currencies and make sure that the tally sheet is pretty equal. So we need to cooperate, but it can be highly costly to us. 
So what has evolution come up with to make sure that we start and then maintain our survival critical relationships? And this comes to the question of how we love. Because evolution has come up with love. At its most basic level, love is a form of biological bribery. It's a set of neurochemicals which are released in your brain when you're first attracted to somebody and when you're in a long-term relationship, which motivate and then reward you for starting and then sticking in that relationship, however hard it may become. So at the most basic level, love is a form of biological bribery. And I'm just going to tell you very quickly now the four key neurochemicals that are involved in supporting you through the attraction stage and into the long term love stage of any relationship. These chemicals underpin all human love, not just romantic love, but all human love and are also involved, for example, to some extent in the love you have for your dog. So we're just going to whiz through them quickly. First of all, we have oxytocin, which I'm sure you all have heard of. It was mentioned at the start of this particular event. So oxytocin is the cuddle hormone, but it's particularly important at the start of relationships because oxytocin works to lower your inhibitions to starting new relationships. And it does this by quieting the amygdala, the fear center of your brain. So that little nagging uh, voice in the back of the head that saps your confidence when you're plucking up the courage to go and talk to somebody new, that is quiet. You feel emboldened when you experience oxytocin. But when oxytocin is released, it's always released at the same time as dopamine. And dopamine, I'm sure you've all heard of, it's your general reward chemical. So you get a hit of dopamine when you do anything you like. However, it's also important because it builds a very good partnership with oxytocin. Dopamine is your hormone of vigor. It is wired into your motor circuits and is the hormone of motivation. And it works very well with oxytocin because they knock each other's rough corners off and enhance each other's positive attributes. So oxytocin is wonderful. It really can make you feel incredibly calm. But if you only released oxytocin when you first saw someone you were attracted to, you might be so incredibly chilled that you do not make the effort, for example, to get off the bar stool and cross the bar and say hello. So we have dopamine there to give you a little bit of a kick to make sure you actually make the effort. So oxytocin orientates your focus in the direction of new people and dopamine makes sure you make the effort to actually start talking to them. The third important neurochemical is serotonin. Now I will say, and I say in the book, that we're not entirely sure what serotonin does yet. It's still being investigated. It's quite a tough one to, uh, to access. But serotonin, we think, is involved in the obsessive elements of love. You do have to be vaguely obsessed with the person you're in love with to bother to coordinate your day or your time with them, to be concerned about how they may feel about something. So obsession, to a certain extent, is important. It's why, for example, when, I don't know, you maybe have a baby and you're obsessed with this little fingernails or you get a new boyfriend or girlfriend and you spend your whole time staring at their photo. It's that element of love. And the reason why we think serotonin is involved in the obsessive element of love is because when we fall in love, whilst the other three neurochemicals go up, serotonin goes down. And this is also what happens in people who have obsessive compulsive disorder. People with obsessive compulsive disorder have lowered levels of serotonin in their blood. So we think serotonin might be involved in that obsessive element, but we do need to do more research looking into that. So those three are really critical and they are there and very active in the first stages of love. But the problem is, particularly with oxytocin, is that oxytocin is not particularly long lasting and it's only released in any real quantity in those relationships which are involved in reproduction. So it's re it's released in relationships, for example, and particularly during sex, but it's also released during childbirth and breastfeeding. So it's quite closely tied to reproduction itself. Also, oxytocin, we reach uh, tolerance to it quite quickly and therefore there's two problems with it. First of all, it cannot underpin the decades long relationships that humans are capable of having. Oxytocin was first discovered as being an important neurochemical for love in little tiny furry voles. And bearing in mind they only last about a year and their reproductive relationships are only a few weeks, then it's great for something like that. But for us, where we can you know, go on and on and on for decades, we need something more powerful. Secondly, we also need something that will underpin relationships that are not related to reproduction. So our platonic friendships, our family relationships, those relationships that actually are the biggest factor in our social networks. So what we have then is what I like to think of as the king of bonding chemicals, and that's mainly because it's the one I study, and that is beta endorphin. 
Beta endorphin, I'm sure you've all heard of. It's associated with particularly exercise. So if you get a, a high after you've done your exercise, that is beta endorphin. But beta endorphin also underpins your long term relationships and it works because it's addictive. It's your body's opiate. It first evolved to be part of your body's painkilling system, and it's been co-opted into the social system. And beta endorphin is wonderful because it acts as an addictive opiate. So when you're with somebody, you get a wonderful hit, you feel euphoric, you feel warm, you feel content. When they go away from you, you start to go cold turkey, and therefore you are drawn back to the source of your opiate hit. But the other thing is it's produced by loads of different uh activities, behaviors that we can do with lots of different sorts of people. So it's released by when you dance, when you sing, when you laugh, when you exercise, when you touch each other. So it's capable of underpinning lots of different sorts of relationship. And the amazing thing about beta endorphin, if you ever do anything in synchrony in a group, so let's say you go and do some dancing and you're all in synchrony, or you go to a comedy store and you all laugh together, you get a ramped up release of beta endorphin. For some reason, when humans do one of the beta endorphin releasing activities in synchrony, then it whacks up the effect of that beta endorphin. So it's really important for underpinning our group love as well. So those are our four different neurochemicals. And as I said, they underpin all the different sorts of love that we experience. And they don't change regardless of sexuality, gender, age, any of these things. They are there for all of us. But whilst there are universalities of love, love is also a highly individual experience. As I said at the beginning, how I love and how you love are very likely to be very different. And the reason for that is there are so many different factors that feed into love. Some of them are biological and some of them are sociological. So I'm just going to touch on a few of those right now. So on the biological side of things, one of the major things that, that we've researched at Oxford is the genetic underpinnings of love. So do your genes and the variation of your genes compared to the person next to you, does that impact the way you might behave or experience love? Because we all know that actually we do behave very differently when we're in love. And when we talk to people about our love experiences, you get a general impression that those vary. So we've looked at the genetics that underpin them. And the genes we've looked at and that I talk about in the book are, are linked to those neurochemicals I've just introduced you to. Uh, one of the really important the ones that we've looked at is the oxytocin receptor gene. And this is what's known as highly polymorphic. What that means is it comes in lots of different sorts of, of versions and therefore underpins a lot of the genetic variation that we see in individual experience of love. So for example, there's one version of the oxytocin receptor gene that if you carry it, you are much more likely to be in a long-term relationship with somebody. You're much more likely to be motivated to find somebody and stick in that relationship. And when you're in them, you are much, much happier. You, you report really good life satisfaction. I like to call that version the nesting gene. People who have it seem to be settling down, feathering their nest and being really happy in there, all cozy with their partner. Obviously, if you carry the other version of the, that gene, we see a slight opposite. We see people who are less likely and less motivated to find a partner. If they're in relationships, they seem to be less satisfied by them and I'm afraid they tend to be more conflictual. So there does seem to be a genetic influence upon how people experience and behave in love. The other thing about the oxytocin receptor gene is it's linked to your ability to empathize. So how strong an empath you are. Now, empathy, particularly within Western contexts, is a very important thing in maintaining cooperative uh, relationships. I will say in Western contexts, because we are an individualistic society and therefore we put more uh pressure on empathy than, for example, a collectivist society would. So therefore, empathy, emotional intelligence is really important in our society. But how good you are to empathy is partly related to your genes. There are five points on the oxytocin receptor gene which can vary. And in one version of these, the more of these points you have, the better you are empathizing. So have one of these points, you're mm, pretty baseline. If you have all five, then you are a serious empath. So there does seem to be some influence. The other things that the oxytocin receptor gene can impact are your attachment profile. You might have heard of your attachment profile. It's one of the things can influence how you behave when you're in love and how you experience love. And we form attachments quite rarely in life. It's a very deep psychological mindset. And we form very few attachment relationships in our lives. Maybe we do to our carers when we are little. We maybe do to our lovers, but not necessarily all of them. We do to our children and we do to some of our friends. And attachment relationships are important because they are developmentally influential, particularly when you're a child. Uh, and I would have said 10 years ago when I started studying attachment, I would have said it's 100 percent your environment. The attachment styles you have as an adult are very much influenced by those you have as a child. And that is still to some extent true. 
However, the more we look into the genes that we work with, the more we see that actually, particularly the oxytocin receptor gene has some influence on the nature of your attachment. So whether you, for example, are a secure attachment type or you are an insecure or anxious attachment type. So that can really influence it as well. So our genetics are really important. Our attachment profile is going to influence how we uh, behave when we're in love. And also our environment. As we know, all things to do with genetics, it's always a combination with what happens in the environment. And the more we dig into the genetics of love, the more that that intervention, that, that relationship between the two becomes more and more complex, to be honest with you. But we do know that the most important environment when it comes to your lifelong experience of love, your lifelong behavior when you're in love, is the relationships you build in the first two years of your life. So the attachments you have to your carers, the relationships that you observe within your family, your extended family, or within your community. And the reason for that is this. As I explained at the beginning, human babies are born very, very early. And they take a good two years after they're born to come to a stage of brain development equivalent to example that we would get if they went to full term. But during that time, the bit of the brain that's really powering ahead in terms of construction is your prefrontal cortex, the bit here that's under your forehead. And that is where your social cognition sits. That is where your conscious love sits. So that's where trust is, where empathy is, where reciprocity is. And it's incredibly sensitive to the environment in which it is raised. So we know from studies that if children are born with secure or are raised, sorry, with secure attachments to their carers, if they experience sensitive parenting that, that meets their practical and emotional and developmental needs, then we see increases in density of gray and white matter in that area of the brain, which shows that it's got a powerful set of neurons there all really well connected, and that kid is set up to have healthy and secure relationships going forward. However, if we have the opposite end of that spectrum and we experience children who've experienced neglect, for example, we see the opposite. We see reductions in gray and white matter, that what we would have predicted it to be, and in fact, we see neuronal death. And we also see a brain that's been very much bathed in cortisol, which is the stress hormone, which is, which is not a good basis on which to build a brain. And therefore, these children tend to have more chance of struggling as they go through life in building secure attachments in building healthy relationships from which they gain benefits. And we see many more um, antisocial behaviors in children who might have had that experience. However, what I want to say is this. What's really interesting is as we discover more about the, uh, the intervention between environment and the environment in which you were raised and genetics, what we understand is some kids seem to have armor plated genes. And what I mean by that is I've spoken to a lot of people about their childhoods. And sometimes you will get to your speech to someone who has objectively had the most, most horrific childhood, you know, high levels of neglect but they are functioning brilliantly as adults. They have strong, secure relationships to their, to their family, to their friends, to their lover, to their children. They get a lot of positive benefit from, them, from their relationships. Their mental health is good. So you look at these people and think, wow, how did you manage to duck the bullet? And the more we look at these genes, we realize that some genes are what we call differentially susceptible. And what that means is these genes are less affected by the environment in which the person is raised. So even though they are raised in a neglectful environment, their genes are still able to give them a good start in life in terms of the construction of their prefrontal cortex, in terms of their social behavior and their love. So it's a really, really complicated picture when we come to look at the biological side of individual variation. But there are so many inputs that go into it, which mean that we are all loving in a different way. So that's some of the biological elements of the individual experience of love. The other ones that are really important, obviously, are our sociological elements, because we don't exist in this biological vacuum where the only thing that's driving us is our, is our psychology, our biology, our genes. We are brought up in a world which is obsessed by love. If you think of every interaction you have in your day, somewhere in it, there will be rules about relationships, about who you can talk to, who you don't talk to, who you can sort with. And there are rules around love. So if we think about the laws about who you can marry, how you can marry them, we think about politics, religion, education, family, history, rituals, friends, family, all of these people feed into how you feel about love. 
the, the relationships you've seen as you've grown up, these stories you've been told, the films you have watched, the rules that your religion says about acceptable and unacceptable forms of love. These will all feed into your mindset and into your creation of what love is in your mind. And as an anthropologist, whilst it's unusual for a scientist to start to look at the sociological side of love, I think it's really critical to you because you do not get a full picture of what feeds into someone's experience of love without understanding those cultural sociological inputs as well. And for example, one that's really powerful is the media influence. We are all obsessed with other people's relationships. I don't know about you, but a lot of the things we follow on Instagram, on social media, are often reflecting on people's relationships, whether it be with their lover, whether it be their family, whether it be with their with their friends. If you think on telly, I don't know about you, but if you go on Netflix, there are so many dating shows. So we are obsessed with watching things about relationships and about people's love. And that molds our opinion of what love is. And there's a, a lot in the book about that. And I think the public face of love is really important. And I'll give you one story as to why that is. Homosexuality is illegal in 72 countries in the world. Now, if you think as maybe as a heterosexual person or in a country where homosexuality is accepted, how you display your love to the world. You might post on Instagram, you might message each other on, on WhatsApp about it, you display it, you have parties to celebrate your engagement, your marriage, whatever it might be. You are really open about your love and you are shouting it from the rooftops and that's going to affect how you feel, your experience of that relationship. In those countries, there's none of that. You have to hide your love. You have to be very careful about who you tell about your love. You spend a lot of time being really worried about being caught because in some of these countries, it is punishable by death. And that will really influence your experience of love. So I think it's critical as an anthropologist that I also look at how the public faces of love, the sociological influences that are on love. So that's the why of love and the how of love to a certain extent. But what about who we love? Wow, we are incredibly lucky. We love so many different types and beings. And in the book, I've really tried to cover all these different sorts of love. So we get a real idea about the spectrum. So we find love within our community. Our community is so incredibly important. I think, I don't know about you, but certainly my community here, particularly during COVID, we all came together and we developed some really powerful, strong bonds. So our community is important. And again, that's underpinned particularly by dopamine and beta endorphin. We love within our families. We have family love. You know, we are the only ape and one of only 5% of our mammals, for example, that has investing fathers. So the idea that we have families, that we have extended families is actually quite unusual. But we have the love that underpins that, mainly to help us raise our children. We have friendships. There are some other animals that experience friendships, but we have so many friends and our friends are really critical in tours. In my book, I actually uh, write it in the chapter, chapter four, underestimated, because I think maybe a little bit we underestimate how important our friend love is. Because particularly in this day and age, when maybe people are choosing to remain single or they're choosing not to have children, those in the past have been your survival critical relationships. Those have been the ones that have supported you through life. But if you decide not to have that in your life, you choose not to have that in your life, then actually your survival critical relationships are your friends. It's really important that you invest in them. And we did a study at Oxford comparing what you gain, for example, from your romantic lover and what you gain from your, from your best friend. And best friends are really important, that close group of friends. For women, your best friend tends to be more emotionally intimate to you than your lover, for example. You will share more emotionally intimate things with your best friend than you might with your lover. And for men, their best best friend is really the source of true relaxation of being able to be themselves completely and utterly so friendships are the place where you can truly be yourself where you can truly relax they are really really critical and we're very lucky to have them obviously we have we have romantic love and in the book I try and broaden that spectrum of romantic love a little bit. We tend to be a little bit stuck on monogamous romantic love, you know, the idea that there's the one or that it's a zero sum game. But actually the spectrum of, of, of romantic love stretches from polyamy to aromantics. And therefore I try and explore all those different inputs into romantic love within the book. And that was actually for me, one of the most interesting set of interviews I carried out. There is science in there too. We do look at, uh, look at that within the scanner, but actually talking to people about their relationships, about polyamorous relationships, or being a romantic in a world which is apparently obsessed with romantic love um, was really, really interesting. We also, oh, we've got a bit of a delay, I think. Hold on one second. 
Yes, we're delaying. There we go. Uh, we've got the love we have for our children. And one of my big things, as I think was mentioned at the beginning, um, I've written a book about fathers and the love they have for their children. So there we go. We've got a daddy and a daughter there. Um, so we have love for our children. And that's a really important input that we have into our children's lives. Oh, we've decided to seize completely now. Religious love and love of pets. So they weren't supposed to come up together. I'm not equating the two. But let's go with religious love, first of all. For me, sacred love, religious love, is one of the most fascinating aspects of, of the human capacity for love, because we are capable of loving a being who does not manifest in physical form. So whilst all our other forms of love are very much based on physical presence, on touch, we are capable of having a loving relationship with somebody, something that we will never actually be able to touch. And there's a whole chapter in the book upon this, because I think for a start, it shows the immensity of the human brain that we are capable of doing that. What I find absolutely fascinating through my interviews with nuns in the book, but also through the neuroscience of, of religious love, that these relationships with God, particularly, um, I mainly looked at nuns and we looked at God, um, are interactions akin to the love you have for a fellow human who is on this earth, a, a physical human. The studies that, for example, have been done looking at Carmelite nuns in scanners and asking them to go into mystic trances and, and commune with God during those sessions, you see the love center of the brain light up. So it's got the fingerprint of love, but you also see the areas of the brain which light up when you interact with a fellow human. And it's very, very powerful stuff. We also, of course, love our animals. Um, I couldn't write a book about love without bringing in love of animals and particularly here, love of dog. This is my new dog, Eva. She is nine months old and she's incredibly naughty, but I love her. Um, so I interviewed lots of people about their loves of dogs during lockdown. But we all, I also did a lot of work looking at whether or not dogs really do love us or whether they just love the biscuits we give them. Actually, they do love us. There's a brilliant study that's been done by Greg Burns at Emory University, where he actually trained dogs to go in a scanner and lie still. I can tell you how hard it is to get humans to lie still in a scanner. And he proved that when dogs interact with us, they really do love us. So it's really, really powerful stuff. And for me, as an anthropologist, it's astonishing because it's an interspecies love. So we love across the species boundary. Love a celebrity. I'm afraid I didn't get to interview Lady Gaga, unfortunately. I did interview her fans. Um, and I looked at celebrity love, which is also known as parasocial love. So the same mechanism we use to be able to love a god, we think is probably being co-opted to be able to love celebrities. There's only really been the concept of celebrity since the 1950s, when people regularly got tellies in their houses and these people came into their homes. Obviously, we now have them coming into our homes 24-7 on social media. But the work around parasocial love and the attachments that people build to famous people and the benefits they gain from them is a really interesting area of study. And finally, the book is very also uh, into looking at the future of love. And one of the things I look at is the role for AI in future love. Now, there's been a lot of talk here in the UK, and there's a lot of work, in fact, done in America academically, looking at the development of humanoid robots, that, which might be used to care. Now, to be able to care for somebody, you have to be able to empathize with them. If you can actually program a, a robot to empathize, then you can actually program it to have a relationship with you. And therefore, the question is, could you ever, for example, become friends with a humanoid robot? Could you love a humanoid robot? Would it have the same benefits as a human to human love or even a sacred love? Now, I'm quite on the fence on this. If you read the book, you'll find out why. I think there's some big ethical questions there, but it's a really interesting area of research. And it then stretches also into the metaverse, whether we could fall in love as avatars. Uh, and also the other area of future love I look at in the book is love drugs. So could we ever develop a drug that enabled you to fall in love? And again, lots of ethical questions there, but it's something that's on the boundary. So what is love? The big question. Well, do you know what? I can't give you the total answer to that. The book has tried to give you as rounded and holistic a picture as we possibly can where we are at the moment, but no one will ever be able to fully answer the question, what is love? And that is because love has a subjective element. So I don't know that when we all talk about love, we're even talking about the same sensation and we will never know that. We know more than we've ever known before about love, but we will never be able to give you a formula for love and we will never be able to completely predict, for example, who will fall in love with who. But love is survival. It is motivation. It is personal, as we know. It is an addiction because of the neurochemistry involved. It is a psychological attachment, which is developmentally so important to you. It is highly public. You love in public unless you are restricted from loving in public, in which case your experience of love is very much affected. 
It is exclusive or is it actually is there a spectrum of, for example, uh, romantic love? And do we need to take more time paying attention to things like polyamory? Love is underestimated, particularly when it comes to our friendships. And I really do feel we need to shove our friendships up that little hierarchy a little bit. And finally, love is about control. Now, ultimately, love, the evolution of love is about uh, is about evolution trying to control us. It's trying to make sure we invest in those relationships and make sure those genes carry on down the generations. It's a benign control and it's control actually that most of us find hugely enjoyable, but is control nonetheless. But one of the downsides of love is that because we have such a visceral, a powerful psychological need for love, the fact that we need it, we crave it, can be used, unfortunately, to abuse, coerce and manipulate us. So there is one chapter in in the book on the darker side of love. And the reason why I wanted to include it was because many people shy away from that. Beyond jealousy, they don't really want to talk about the negative sides of love. Indeed, some of the people I interviewed said that if it was negative, it wasn't love at all. So there is a chapter in the uh, in the book about the darker side of love and the fact that people can use love to control this. So I look at the dark triad personality, people who are Machiavellian, have psychopathy and also are narcissistic and how they tend to use more negative ways of retaining their mates within their relationship. I do look at the role for love in intimate partner violence, and I also look at how The neurochemistry of love can be understood by charismatic leaders, some of whom are marvellous, but unfortunately, some of whom are are also despots and they can lead their followers who are addicted to them in the same way you might be addicted to your partner to do the most unconscionable things. So I think if we're going to give a 360 of the story of love, we also have to embrace that dark side. I'd really like to thank you for listening. There's a lovely, don't you think that's a beautiful cover? I was so excited when I saw it. If you're interested in my work anyway, I do have a website and you can follow me on Twitter. And I'm really looking forward to your questions. Thank you. I will stop sharing. Thank you very much, doctor. Um, Please answer your questions in the Q&A or in the chat if you're on YouTube. But uh, in the meantime, I have a couple of questions regarding, I, I found it really entertaining about when you, did experimentations with the Carmelite nuns mm. when you, I think you put them in a scanner of some sort. Yeah, so that wasn't, about- that wasn't me. That was actually a colleague okay. in, in another country, but um, <laughs> yeah, it's the most fascinating study. And it's, for me, it's a really powerful study because I think I'm not particularly strongly religious. And first mm-hmm. of all, in talking to the nuns, when I spoke to them, just the, the sheer power of the love they have for mm-hmm. God and the role for God in their lives and the, the fact that it is a, a full relationship, you know, there's reciprocity, you know, they, they give things to God, God gives things to them. They work hard to maintain their relationship with God. You know, God is there, you know, they will speak of God as their brother, their father, their lover, very, very powerful. So when you speak to them, you powerfully feel this is a love, but then when you put them in a scanner and you also objectively get a measure that says, yeah, this is lighting up the screen. This brain looks like anybody else who's in love with, you know, their partner or their child or whatever. And also when you see that, the reason why the prefrontal cortex lighting up and showing that they they are interacting with a fellow human is important is because Mm. when we look at people, for example, who are interacting with humanoid robots who look like humans Mm -hmm. and have been programmed to do things like humans, you get nothing in the prefrontal cortex. We know that those, um, those humans, that brain knows that that's not a human. Wow. It won't. But when you look at somebody interacting with God, they are interacting with a fellow human. And I just think that's really powerful stuff. And you yeah. did interview some of these nuns. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's funny because I grew up in a Catholic school environment and I don't go to church anymore. But I just remember what struck me was how they were married to God mm-hmm. and they would wear a wedding ring. You know, mm-hmm. the nuns were in the wedding rings and you actually interviewed some of these people. And, mm-hmm. you know, I was wondering about your, what experience did you come away from interviewing these nuns? For me, it was really interesting. Cause as I said, I, I wasn't brought up Catholic. I was brought up church of England. So first of all, the whole mm-hmm. nun thing is, is not really something we have in the church of England. So to, mm-hmm. to contemplate the idea of, yeah, marrying yourself to God for your life, committing yourself to God for your life, you know, not having any, you know, not having a round to partner, not having children, you know, that's, that's a hard thing, I think, for me to contemplate. And then, so when I spoke to them, it was amazing because they were talking about a relationship that was fully human. 
and everything they got from God and all the benefits he underpinned and how he supported them and how they tried to support him through their works. So, you know, I would say to them, okay, what does God give to you? Oh, well, God gives me everything. God, you know, and then I'd say, and what do you, what do you give to God? And they go, well, I, I, I can't, you know, I can't give him, I, I imagine that I, what I can give him is, is just not good enough. But, you know, I try to mm. give to him through my good works, for example. And so that was very powerful. And I think one of the ones that I maybe found the most challenging, I mean, as an anthropologist, you are very much trained to record and observe, you know, you're trained not to, mm-hmm. but I must admit every now and then your own experience comes in. Now I'm, I ask all my interviewees, what's the most powerful love you've experienced? And a lot of them yeah. will say my children, for example. And I would say that that's that's up there for me. My I think probably the most powerful love I have is as a mother. But I actually interviewed one Anglican nun. Anglican nuns are quite rare, but I interviewed one. And what was interesting about her is unlike the Catholic nuns who hadn't experienced romantic love or had any children, she had been both married and had children and got grandchildren. And then she had become a nun. She became a vicar and then she became a nun. So she had experienced all these other sorts of love. So for me, it was amazing because I could ask her to compare them. And I think possibly one of the most challenging times during the interviews for me was when I said to her, okay, so what is the most powerful love you've ever experienced? And she said, my love of God. Yeah. Now, for me as a mother, a little bit of me, I did go, <gasps> obviously I didn't show it, but I was like, whoa, it's that powerful. Mm. And I think that's, that's, that was really something for me that, that I found really brought it home to me, how incredibly important this form of love is. Interesting. Fascinating. Uh, Somebody's asking about animals. Can mm. animals, are they really capable of love? It's, do you know what? What's really difficult about studying animals with love is we hold them to a higher level of evidence than we do ourselves. So if I were to say to you, do you love so-and-so? And you said, yes, I would go, okay. And I would believe you with no objective. I wouldn't have to shove you in a scanner. I wouldn't, you know, be doing any of those things, taking your neurochemical levels, observing you. I would just say, okay, you love. For an animal, we have to try, obviously we can't ask that. And also we probably wouldn't believe them. So we try and objectively measure them. And because there's no complete formula for love, you will always get people who go, ah, but we don't completely know. I think that, yes, some of the higher animals, some of the more social animals definitely experience love. We know from a dog study that you put a dog in a scanner and it loves its human. Uh, we've seen evidence in elephants. We've seen evidence in dolphins. We've seen elephants in, a, in um, we've seen evidence in the apes and a lot of the primates. And the pool is growing as to how animals and the way we try and assess whether an animal feel loves is put it through various stages of testing. So does it have the neurochemistry that underpins human love? Does it build attachments, psychological attachments? Does it exhibit empathy? Does it have relationships that sit outside the reproductive? So does it have friendships? Um, And the last one is, does it grieve? Because grief is the loss of love. Mm -hmm. And I think if as an animal you grieve, then you then you are grieving in the loss of love. And, and certainly, you know, um, there is a lot of evidence now, for example, that elephants grieve, that dogs grieve, that dolphins grieve. Um, so I personally do think there are animals. And it's also what is love? Do we say that they've got to have human levels of love? Or there's a wonderful neuroscientist who studied love, who unfortunately now died, called Yak Panksepp. And he said, all human love is, is human love is the bun, is the cupcake with the frosting on the top. <laughs> Actually, the cupcake is the love and all animals have that. We've just decided to overcomplicate it with some frosting on the top. It's just ah. a, a wonderful addition, but it, you don't necessarily need the frosting to be able to love. And I think that's the best way of explaining it. That's very interesting. It's funny you mentioned uh, about grieving because I was just at the cemetery visiting my parents' graves. And yesterday I just encountered a, a flock or a murder of crows. Mm. Here, I'll just share the picture. And they were oh, doing wow, nothing yeah. but silently standing there with, they weren't yeah. pawing, they weren't eating, they weren't doing anything. They were just yeah. there. I just thought that was really interesting. And I, I what's read really interesting that. is, yeah, it's corvids. So they're corvids. Corvids are really corvids. intelligent. Yes. Um, so it's quite possible that they do experience love and they do experience grief because they are a very, very intelligent group of birds. Yes, yes. I think I think, you know, we just have to be more open. Unfortunately, humans, some humans and some scientists <laughs> um, have this sort of human exceptionalism going on. And actually, I'm not sure we're quite as exceptional as we think we are. I think. A lot ah. Of- <laughs> ah, that's a blow to our egos. Our Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a question from Ruby saying, 
What is purported benefit to someone who says they love a celebrity or someone else in the public eye? Okay. The research in this area is is young, parasocial love. Um, We haven't managed to put any parasocial love in a scanner yet. What's really interesting, though, is the studies that have been done, particularly, for example, looking at um, young LGBTQ plus people who find attachments to celebrities online and from... Because what we gain from our relationships, if we have an attachment to someone, is we get security from them. They give us confidence. They give us guidance. And they make us feel that we're not alone. And what there's been some brilliant studies, which I quote in the book, um, about LGBTQ plus children who maybe live in a community, maybe they haven't come out, maybe they live in a community where there aren't many examples or anyone they can turn to. And actually, Mm -hmm. a lot of them follow... I have parasocial attachments to people online, to LGBTQ plus celebrities. Because by seeing those people, it gives them confidence. They they can start to explore their sexuality. They can start to build their self-esteem. They can start to get confidence about being who they are. And some really powerful studies out there about that. So I think in the past, we have dismissed parasocial relationships as kind of teenage crushes. And if they were experienced in adults, then there's something wrong with that adult. You know, that's not normal. But actually, parasocial relationships in the same way that that relationships with, for example, God or anybody like that, if they bring something to you that benefits you, if they give you the determination to be yourself, then that is one of the definitions of love is to is to is for that person to lift you up. And I think for Mm. some people, parasocial relationships lift them up. Interesting. Oh, Anonymous attendee wanted to know, are you saying that when it comes to love, it's not a level playing field? Some are more likely to find it because of genetics and brain chemistry? It's not, it depends, right, okay. The genetic side of it, it's really hard to say because the brain chemistry and the genetics are important, but they're not the be all and end all. So you could have the best set of genes, but let's say you were maybe you were brought up in an environment that wasn't great, that just wipes out the effect of those genes. It's a really subtle interaction. So yeah, people say that to me sometimes. Mm. They'll say, you know, okay, um, yeah, I, I'm not very empathetic or I don't think I've got particularly high circulating, I don't know, beta endorphin mm-hmm. or I had an awful childhood. So does that mean I'm just, a, you know, predestined to not be able to do this? No, it's really, really complicated, really complicated. Yes, if mm-hmm. you are genetically predisposed to be less empathetic, you might struggle a little bit instinctively, but I think what I always say to people is it's very complicated. And when people struggle with relationships, there are so many interventions because we understand what love is to a certain extent now that we can develop to help them. So some of the work we've done has gone forward to help, for example, um, parents who can't bond with their children. We now know behaviors that those parents can do with those children to generate neurochemistry, to generate attachment, to enable them to build the bonds. So there are always interventions that can be done. So you are not Mm. at the mercy of your biology or your psychology um, because it's Mm -hmm. all reasonably plastic. Oh, interesting. So we we have a great question to end on uh, here. Our last question from Alfred. Anna, what is unconditional love? Oh, what is unconditional love? That's a really big one, isn't it? I... uh, Well, unconditional love is the one that comes with no strings, doesn't it? And it's a very rare form of love. I actually genuinely do think dogs have unconditional love, Uh, particularly if you've ever worked with like one of the dogs I've got at the moment was rescued and was treated pretty badly and still loves humans. And I think that's amazing. That's that's unconditional love. I'm not sure how many humans do unconditional love. There is, there is, for most people, a limit, so particularly in romantic relationships. I don't think romantic relationships are unconditional. But I must admit, it's not something we've scientifically measured. So that's just my opinion. Wow. So <laughs> do you have any closing remarks before we... Uh, take I just, I really hope that everybody's gained a little insight about themselves, maybe from this. And I hope if you do go on to read the book, to buy the book, that you really do find something in there that's for you. Because that was the point of the book, is that it is a science book. But at the end of the day, I want it to have a connection with everybody uh, because I think it's really important that we appreciate the love we have in our lives and that we nurture it. Well, Anna, we appreciate the fact that you published this this Pegasus book. It's an amazing (laughs) book. And I wish you congratulations and all the success. Thank you very much. And everyone, thank you for joining us. Please buy Why We Love. 
the new science behind our closest relationships. Dr. Animation, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much. Us.